Okay, I'm going to give you all a little bit of an intelligence test. <laughs> because I'm going to talk about the characteristics of somebody, and I'm going to see if anybody can figure out who that is. <laughs> now, first of all, somebody graduates from West Point about 1975. That's one clue. But this person believes in education. Because he gets a master's degree in education, he gets a master's degree in business, and then he goes to the Army War College, Staff College, and the, all that kind of stuff. So he's got a, knows a lot. So who is this guy anyway? Any of you figured this out? <laughs> well, I guess you'd have to say it's General Austin, who now is the commander of the Central Command, and man, that is where the action is. So, General, we're anxious to hear from you. We're honored that you're here, and we look forward to your comments. You know, as a CENTCOM commander, I spent about half my time traveling throughout the Middle East and parts of South and Central Asia. And I meet routinely with senior military and civilian officials, and they share their concerns, and they ask for our support. They also provide invaluable insights on the security situation. And it is through these engagements that we increase awareness and effectiveness and strengthen our partnerships and build trust among nations. At the end of the day, all of us have a vested interest in seeing a stable and secure region achieved. And success will require everyone working together towards this common goal. There are some that believe that our security relationships are based upon our dependency uh, for energy, or our desire for energy. And that's not the, not the case. And it's also not the case that uh, we are energy independent at this point. You know, we, we are working towards that end, but we still have uh, some, uh, some work to do. Uh, and it'll be several years before we can approach, we, we approach that point. But there, some of our allies believe that, you know, again, as we become energy independent, we're going to turn and leave the region. And so what I continue to do as I talk to the leaders in the region is to reassure them that we have vital interest in the Middle East. And those are not going to change. Protection of the of the uh, key shipping lanes. You know, 60% of the, of the world's energy is in that region, so those shipping lanes have to remain open. And even if we are energy independent, if, those, uh, if that commerce gets interrupted, it will affect the global economy, and it, that will affect our economy. So that's a vital interest for us. The protection of our homeland is also a vital interest. And to counter the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, I mean, this is really important. If you think about where we were 18 months ago with Syria, uh, trying to get control over their uh, uh, chemical weapons, we're in a different place now, but it's not completely resolved. Uh, and uh, and we, we now see Iran trying to obtain a nuclear weapon. Uh, we'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Pakistan has nuclear weapons, and again, as I said earlier, they also have Al-Qaeda in the backyard. And if it doesn't concern you that, that uh, you know, here's a country with nuclear weapons and Al-Qaeda, I mean, if that doesn't make you uh, restless at night, then, uh, then we probably, there's something wrong. Uh, and so another reason to keep pressure on this uh, very dangerous element of Al-Qaeda. We can expect to see more lone wolf type activity. Uh, what's most dangerous about what we're seeing here, uh, certainly, you know, the activity of these extremists and terrorists, I mean, it's, it's, it's disgusting, uh, and it needs to be kept in check. Uh, but what the driver is behind all of that is the ideology that, that gives uh, these actions, uh, you know, birth. And, and, and so we not only have to counter the actions, but we have to do something as an international community to counter the ideology. And we have to go after those conditions that, are, that, that enable that ideology to flourish. And so 
this is going to require an international effort, uh, and it's going to take time to, 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 to get after this. But, but yeah, I think we can expect to see more of that kind of thing going forward. This entire uh, regional problem of Iraq and Syria, so complex. Uh, as you know, our Iraq-Syria uh, uh, campaign uh, calls for us to try to uh, reestablish security and stability in, in Iraq first, and then, move, and then transition to, uh, to Syria. Uh, to continue to counter ISIL. It is a counter ISIL campaign. Um, clearly, there are, as we take actions to, uh, to put more pressure on, on ISIL, and we are putting significant pressure on this organization and good effects in Iraq and Syria, uh, clearly Assad can benefit from that. And, and uh, but where we may have uh, a common enemy here currently, we clearly don't have common interest. And we've been very, uh, very vocal about the fact that our vision of Syria in the future does not include Assad. And, uh, and so uh, any thought of us collaborating with uh, the Syrian leadership is, uh, is, is not a well-placed thought. I think uh, that's, uh, that's not going to happen. With respect to Iran, uh, some of the same types of things. Clearly, we have a common enemy, but we don't have common interest. Uh, and uh, we have some common interest, but clearly, uh, this is a difficult, has been a difficult country for us to work with. We're doing some things to try to negotiate uh, uh, an agreement with, uh, along with other nations. Uh, on Iran's uh, nuclear program. It's going to take more time to get this done. Uh, but even when that happens, as I said before, it doesn't mean Iran's going to turn into a nice guy overnight. The stands remain our, our, one of the key opportunities in our region. And I think for a reasonable amount of investment, uh, we can develop partnerships and develop partner capacity in those countries that I think will pay uh, significant dividends. And so we're going to continue to invest in that. And I, see, I think we see. I know that we see uh, a lot of things uh, incrementally moving forward in the stands, and that's, that's, uh, that's very encouraging. Egypt, Egypt is an important country, uh, an important country to the region and an important country to the United States of America. Why is it important? Well, you know, it's got a significant uh, Muslim population there in Egypt. It is highly respected uh, throughout, the, throughout the world. Uh, and certainly uh, in the region. It has ownership of the Suez Canal. That's an important choke point that, uh, that I think provides a, a significant operational and strategic value to us. Uh, it has a peace treaty with Israel, which is really, really important. And we want to see things between Egypt and Israel continue to trend positive. And right now, I would characterize uh, that relationship as, uh, as in a pretty good place. So uh, our military uh, to military relationships in Egypt are strong. My very first platoon sergeant, a guy by the name of Fox Ballard, told me, Lieutenant, let me get you straight. Don't worry about being a general. Worry about being a good lieutenant and worry about being a good leader and stay focused on taking care of these troops that are placed in your charge. And no matter if you're a lieutenant, if you're a major, if you're a colonel, if you follow that philosophy, these troops will refuse to let you fail. They will refuse to let you fail. And you know, I've tried to follow that throughout, and old Fox Ballard was right. The quality of our men and women in uniform is just is astounding. And, and, and I saw that quality played out in, uh, in, in incredible ways as we were you know, attacking from um, uh, Kuwait up to, to, to seize Baghdad. The things that our troops did for each other and the things that they would do for their leaders is just incredible. They believe in what they're doing. They believe in their country. They want to make a contribution. They deserve good leadership. And if you stay focused on them, it's probably going to work out just fine. 
but they're gonna follow you if they, believe, if they think you believe in what you're doing and you're confident in what you're doing. And so old Fox Ballard was, uh, was right. You know, I'm approaching 40 years of service now and, and uh, you know, I think back, our volunteer military has been in, uh, in play for 41 years now. So I've, th I've seen this thing through from its inception to, to the current time and I got to tell you, I mean, there, you think back, uh, we kind of started down this path of skepticism about whether or not we could have an effective military with volunteers. You think about what your troops have done over and over and over again, volunteers. They've been able to do that because they've had great families that support them. As important, they've been able to do that because they've had people like you that support them, that believe in what their country's doing, that believe in what the military does, and without your support, this doesn't work. And that support has been incredible. I would just ask that as we go forward, don't forget about these troops. It'll be easy to do. Don't forget about them. They've, they've made a lot of great sacrifices on our behalf. They do it because it's what they want to do. But they deserve a little bit more, you know, as they, as they transition in life and as they, as they deal with some very difficult problems. And so we're going to need your continued support uh, as, we try, as they try to handle the future. Thanks a lot for allowing me to join you tonight. Uh, this has been... Uh, uh, a really special experience and, and a great day overall for me. Uh, God bless each and every one of you.